today. I've got somebody who's very conscientious about turning this off. Here, well. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about morality, as I say, not so much about suffering and violence, although we could perhaps draw those, extrapolate those from our talk on morality. Next week, we're going to get sort of edge into the influence of religion today and then get into that in more detail next week. And then on the 20th, our concluding one-hour lecture, and then the second hour will be the final exam. Again, I encourage you to take that exam to, to study the materials because it's the best way to learn it. All right, so today we're going to get into uh, morality. And the real question we start with is um, the existence of objective moral values. The question really is, why do most rational people believe in objective morality? That is, why do people generally think that some actions are right and some actions are wrong, regardless of people's subjective opinions? And as I say here, why does almost everyone agree that is evil or wicked, number one, for someone to walk into a random house, shoot everyone in it, and steal everything inside, or two, for a man to beat and rape a kind, innocent woman, three, for an adult to torture an innocent child just for the fun of it, or four, for parents to have children for the sole purpose of abusing them sexually. Horrible examples. But they're horrible for the very reason that we can all look at that and say, how insane would you have to be? How pathologically, mentally deranged to think that any of those things were okay. Doesn't matter what your religious views are, everyone agrees that those are wrong. Well, Michael Roos, who's an atheist, an atheist who often takes exception with Dawkins and Sam Harris and these people, says, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says that two plus two is five. In fact, there is something absolutely, objectively, inherently true that some things are right and some things are wrong. All right, you get that point. Um, in November 2006, there was a, an event, an atheist event, held in La Jolla, California, which was called the Beyond Belief Symposium. The first time they had this, um, the conference was identified as being for the purpose of discussing science, religion, and God, and specifically, whether or not science should do away with religion. It's like we gave them permission to do that, right? Um, that was the intention. And in fact, a major article that was written for New Science Magazine by writer Michael Brooks was entitled, In Place of God. The idea being that science, the, the purely naturalistic view of the world and of humanity was at the point, on the cusp, of being able to completely do away with religion. To replace God, to, to do something else than believe in God. But interestingly, the very next year, 2007, when they had the Beyond Belief 2, uh, they, they took a much more modest kind of attitude toward it. In fact, the title of the article in the New Science Magazine the second year was it was God's Place in a Rational World. You hear the difference? Rather than it being in place of God, it's God's place in a rational world. There was much more of a sense in that second event that religion is here to stay and that there are things about religion. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the major speakers there, Michael Riley, who is a, an atheist, um, he said, quote, religion is not going away, even though they believe that religion is unnecessary. Now, one of the major reasons why even the most hardcore, now not the new atheists, because they're not, they're not as smart as some of the other atheists, to be quite honest with you uh, about it. Besides the Richard Dawkinses and the Sam Harrises and a few others, most even of the atheists in the world recognize that there is an objective set of moral values. And they have no way of explaining from a naturalistic point of view where those values come from. Quite simply, we believe that there are things that are right and wrong in the world. We all agree on the extremes, at least, of that. There may be some gray areas in between. You know, is it right to cheat on your taxes if you think that the government is moral or whatever? But in terms of these kind of examples, nobody who's not mentally ill disagrees on those things. From where do we get that objective morality? That really is the question. We cannot, as one of the atheists had said, do a CT scan to show us where our perception of human morality, human rights, are located. 
that, um, as one atheist said, human rights are to me as mysterious as the Holy Trinity. It's not an empirical thing. It's just something we strongly believe. It is a purely metaphysical entity. Now, think about that. An atheist saying that moral, objective moral values is a purely metaphysical entity. Recognizing that naturalistic atheists believe there is nothing metaphysical. That the only thing that exists is the physical world. The naturalist view says that the natural physical world is the only thing we've got. How do they then explain the existence of a sense of moral right and wrong in virtually everybody? You know, how do you deal with that? Um, interestingly, there was a series of debates that were held between Dr. Thomas Warren, who is a professor of philosophy and religion and of Christian apologetics at Harding Graduate School in Memphis, Tennessee, and, <laughs> and the yeah. Dr. Warren debated several people. One, Dr. Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew was, was, he's retired now, professor of philosophy at the University of Reading in Reading, England. He was one of the world's best known atheistic philosophers who, by the way, has since said he believes in God. And the main reason is because he's finally realized that naturalistic, uh, he's not a, de a theist, he doesn't believe in a personal God, but he has decided he's a deist. He believes there is some kind of deity out there. Um, and, but initially, he was recognized as one of the world's foremost atheists. He's a philosopher and uh, author of things like evolutionary ethics, God and philosophy, the, Dar uh, the presumption of Darwinian evolution, uh, atheistic humanism, major uh, defender of that side. Well, he debated this Dr. Thomas Warren, who is a Christian, a professor of Christian apologetics and philosophy of religion. Um, and in that debate, according to the rules of the debate, each of them had an opportunity to submit in writing questions to the other one before the debate. The same uh, Dr. Thomas Warren uh, later debated other people, including Dr. Wallace Matson, who's a professor of philosophy at University of California, Berkeley. Both of those uh, times, Dr. Warren submitted a question to these two famous atheistic philosophers. And uh, one of the questions he asked was, true or false? In murdering six million Jewish men, women, and children, the Nazis were guilty of real, that is, objective moral wrong. All right, got the question? In murdering six million Jewish men, women, and children, the Nazis were guilty of real, that is, objective moral wrong. Both Anthony Flew and Wallace Matson, both atheist philosophers, both of them said that is true. So, if they say that it is true that that was evil, that that was wicked, that that was wrong, they are acknowledging that there is such a thing as an objective moral evil. Because according to survival of the fittest, which is not a term that, that Darwin used, but that is consistent with Darwinian you know, uh, uh, natural selection, whoever is strong, whichever being, whichever creature is strong enough to win and eat the other guy, that that's the way it should be. That's the natural order of things. And so when you say that the Nazis who were in power at that time committed an evil by subjugating and executing, you know, killing, murdering millions of people, when you say that that was evil, that that was wicked, you are acknowledging that there is something wrong with the theory of natural selection. That there are more than just naturalistic explanations for our idea of morality in the world. And major philosophers have agreed to that. Okay, Now, um, so this question of where does that objective morality come from is a major problem for the atheist, especially for the new atheists. They constantly are struggling to try to address that. In particular, Sam Harris, who is, in my mind, the least of the new atheists, although he's the one that kind of kicked it off. Um, he has written a book about morality, in which he claims that science, that is uh, Darwinian science, gives you everything you need to try to explain where morality comes from. He is not successful, and I want to talk about that today. The moral argument, as it is presented, and this is what uh, this Dr. Warren that I mentioned, who is the Christian apologist and Christian philosopher, this is how he presented it in that series of debates he had, first with Anthony Flew and later with uh, Matson. The moral argument. One, I'm going to give you the long version and then 
the short syllogism, the short logical argument. One, if the moral code and or actions of any individual or society can properly be subject of criticism as to a real moral wrong, in other words, if we can say that's evil, that's wrong, then there must be some objective standard, some higher law, which is other than the particular moral code and which has an obligatory character which, cannot, uh, which can be recognized. The minute you say, no, that's evil, you, you inherit in that statement is the idea that there are evil things and there are good things, right? That's all that statement says. That's just the first premise. The second premise, the moral code and or actions of any individual or society can be properly subjects of criticism as to real moral wrong. We just demonstrated that with atheistic philosophers who say that the Nazis were wrong in what they did. And then the third point, therefore, there must be some objective standard, some higher law, which is other than the particular moral code and which has an obligatory character which can be recognized. In other words, there is some objective morality, or else we couldn't legitimately say that. And yet everybody agrees that what the Nazis did was wrong. I think most of us would probably argue that the Nazis knew when they were doing it that it was wrong. But it gave them what they wanted, and so they overcame their own objections. Um, or if we state this in terms of a logical argument, and it's at, it becomes a logical argument for God, this is the moral argument for God. One, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. There is nothing greater than the physical world. You know, if, if it's all natural, if it's all naturalistic, if there's nothing greater than the physical world, if God does not exist, then objective moral values can't exist. The premise number two, and yet, as demonstrated, objective moral values do exist. Right? You follow me so far? Conclusion of this, this logical syllogism, God therefore exists. Now, the only way you can attack a logical um, syllogism like this, this is, a, this is the way logic is presented. This is formal logic. You have... Two premises, at least two premises, you sometimes can have more, but the typical three-point syllogism, there is premise number one, premise number two, and then a conclusion. The only way you can refute that is by either proving that the conclusion is inaccurately drawn or to attack one of the premises. There isn't any other way to argue against that. So when even the atheistic philosophers will agree that objective moral values exist. And when they are, un that's premise number two, they'll agree with that one. Yes, the Nazis were wrong, for instance. When, once they recognize, they'll, they'll admit that premise, they then are challenged to say, well, where do those objective moral principles come from? They are metaphysical things. They are not like, we can't do a CT scan and see where it is in the human body that moral values reside. So there is something non-physical about that, non-materialistic, non-naturalistic. Where does that come from? Okay, if you don't believe, I mean, premise number one, you could restate that and say that if, if supernatural something, if metaphysical something doesn't exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Well, they, they acknowledge the fact it comes from somewhere, and they don't know where it is. It's not in the physical world. There is something metaphysical. And so, we, that is a legitimate argument for the existence of God. Does that make sense? You guys following me on that so far? This is the biggest challenge, I believe, that the new atheists face, is trying to explain where this comes from. Because atheism cannot accept an objective morality. It is completely incompatible with their viewpoint. How can an atheist logically call something atrocious or deplorable or evil or wicked, since according to atheism, man is nothing but matter in motion? We are just, you know, one more step in the ladder. We are no different than the lower animals that we evolved from. But if that's true, if we're no different from other animals, how is it we believe that human beings have a sense of the moral? Because we don't run into that with any other animals. We don't accuse a dog of rape if a female dog is in heat and the male dog, you know, takes advantage of that. 
We don't accuse a lion of murder when he tackles and kills and eats an antelope. We do not apply moral evaluations to any creatures other than human beings. So if we are not any different than any other creature, how is it that we do universally have some sense that there is a morality that human beings are subject to? Pigs sometimes eat their babies. We don't accuse, accuse them of infanticide. We go, what are you doing? Stop that. You know, that pig would have grown up and I could have sold it or whatever other reason. But we don't say you have done a moral evil when that happens. And yet, Charles Darwin said, my object in this chapter, a particular chapter of the, the Descent of Man, is solely to show that there is no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental faculties. Meaning, if a great ape kills another creature, we don't accuse that great ape of having done something immoral, right? We don't. We may say that's really unfortunate, but we don't make a moral issue out of it. If a human being kills another creature, even a lower creature, you know, somebody cruelly kills a dog or a kitten or whatever else, we do consider it moral. It doesn't even apply to just if you kill people. We consider it immoral for you to do something that's cruel to lower animals. And yet Darwin insisted that his point was to say that we are only the next level of evolution among the other higher mammals, which he means the great apes, for instance. And yet how is it that there's somehow a jump in our willingness to apply moral values? Anthony Flew said the basic implication of the atheistic system does not allow objective moral right or objective moral wrong. The atheistic system does not allow for that. This is incompatible with naturalistic atheism as according to Darwinism. And yet Anthony Flew, when asked the question, were the Nazis evil in what they did in exterminating all those people? Anthony Flew said yes, they were. Does that not sound like a contradiction to you? The atheistic evolutionist George K. Gaylord Simpson said, man is the result of a purposeless and materialistic process that did not have him in mind. We're no different than anything else. We've just, you know, we're just biological molecules. And yet, same guy, later on in the same document says, good and evil, right and wrong, concepts irrelevant in nature, except from the human viewpoint, become real and pressing features of the whole cosmos as viewed morally because morals arise only in man. How is that? Why is that true if we are only a different kind of animal? You see the problem? Questions or comments about that? How could, how could, how could a guy, supposedly as far as Charles Darwin, say there's no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their, not just their morals, their mental faculties? Well, that's I mean, the whole. If that's the case, why aren't apes inventing computers? <laughs> well, the idea is that we are simply, you know, one step up in the process, but not fundamentally different. And yet, in morals, we are fundamentally different. There is nothing else anywhere close to it. I mean, you could say the the, the old saying, which is actually illogical, it's irrational, that if you set a chimpanzee down at a at a typewriter and he poked at the keys long enough he would eventually come up with you know Shakespearean sonnets or the Bible or something else. No, he wouldn't. Okay. Not in not in all the eons of all time past and projected into the future. You know, the, the statistical improbability of that is beyond scope. Okay, it's impossible. So it's silly to say that. It's not merely random chance. But that's, you know, there we're talking about production of things. But when we talk about morality, there is a fundamental absence of anything that we consider morality in any creature other than humans. So we must somehow be different. We're not just what all of the atheists would say, the most, the, you know, the next step up in, in the ladder. You know, we're just the next rung in the ladder of evolution. There's not anything fundamentally different 
in us than there is from any other creature, according to evolutionary biology. Um, I've got, um, it's interesting that there are a few people who actually take this seriously and draw the, the logical conclusion from evolutionary biology. And that is that there really isn't morality. It's just something we've made up, that there isn't any objective moral truth, even though people do. Now, I'll give you an example, an, an example that I've used before. There, there are a number of what would be called hard atheists. Friedrich Nietzsche was a hard atheist. Jean-Paul Sartre, um, the existentialist philosopher, was a hard atheist. Uh, Albert Camus, the author, was a hard atheist. What that means is they said, yeah, we are just animals. Now, Peter Singer, who is contemporary new atheist, he too, he said, we're no better. You know, if I had to choose between killing two cows or killing one human, I should kill the one human because cows are sentient beings too and there are two of them and one of them, you know. So there are a few people who are hard atheists who do draw what seems to be the logical conclusion, that is that morality isn't real. There is no objective morality. Although they have no evidence for that other than just that has to be the conclusion they draw if they are naturalistic atheists. Interesting, there's, there's a character named, um, what's his first name? Eric Pianca. Eric Pianca in 2006 was named the Distinguished Texas Scientist of the Year. I'm going to assume there's no, what I'm about to tell you has nothing to do with the fact he's from Texas. Um, so he was named the Scientist of the Year. He's chairman of the Environmental Science Section of the Texas Academy of Science. And he condemns the idea, in fact, in his acceptance speech for this award as Texas Scientist of the Year in 2006, his acceptance speech, he condemned the idea, and I quote here, the idea that humankind occupies a privileged position in the universe. He hammered his point home by exclaiming, we are no better than bacteria. Now, because he's envir an environmentalist, that's a lot of his, you know, he's the chairman of the environmental science section, one of the things that he advocates is that human beings are doing so much damage to the planet and to all life that you, I, I've talked about him before. You were, I, I see that recognition in Chris's face anyway. Pianca says that 90% of all human beings should go away for the sake of the planet. That only 10% of all the people now living on the planet should be allowed to remain. And he advocates getting rid of 90% of them. In fact, he has a plan. Airborne Ebola virus. Because he advocates releasing airborne Evo Ebola to kill 90% of the people on the planet for the sake of the planet and all the other organisms on the planet because Ebola will kill in just a matter of a few days. It doesn't take very long. Well, as someone has observed, there are at least 90% of the people on the planet who probably would not agree with him. <laughs> now, that is the logical conclusion for somebody who's a hard atheist, who takes seriously the, the, the you know, um, the inevitable conclusion that scientific naturalism, atheistic naturalism, and evolution uh, comes to. That's where it takes you if you're honest. At least Bianca is honest about it. And Nietzsche was, and Sartre was, and Albert Camus was. But these other guys are not willing to, to be honest about what the conclusions of their own belief system is. Lynn? Isn't he honest, though? Because why doesn't he... Done, done what he's proposed. Is he so afraid he's going to be one of the 90% not able to withstand this? Yeah. And then he values his life above everybody else's? Or does he truly not have a big enough belief in his theory? Yeah, well, uh, so Carolyn and I watched a TV show recently about these two people who worked for the CDC, I think it was, and they actually were trying to release viruses in different cities around the world for the sake of the planet. Same kind of idea, but they weren't looking at 90%. They were just, you know, trying to kill population centers. And the good guys caught them, you know, stopped it. But, uh, but it, so th that, that theme is not unique to Bianca. There are others who have thought that. But the question of, well, if, you're really, if you really believe that, why don't you do something about it? And maybe he doesn't have the mechanism. You don't. You can't go to the local OXO and buy Ebola virus. So maybe the, maybe he's run into practical problems. But um, the realization that this is such a hurdle, such a roadblock. The new atheists have tried to address this, and the reason is, and they've done so 
by making a moral attack against God and against religion. That God is a monster. I tell you what, if Richard Dawkins talked about your sister like he does about God, you would knock him on his butt. <laughs> I mean, just horrible things. Um, the new atheists claim that God is not necessary for, for morality and that human beings can be good without God. They are completely unsuccessful in explaining how that's the case. They try, especially Sam Harris tries, and then Richard Dawkins from him, and I'm going to give you some examples as we go along. They also insist that the Bible is primitive, unacceptable, morally abhorrent, and that religion breeds evil. Morally abhorrent? A morally abhorrent. Because, well, they would say, well, they, they will give you examples. And there are places where they've got a point. Not that their conclusion is correct, but they're... See, it's one thing to observe something, it's another thing to draw the right conclusion from what you observe. They're but, they, but, but they denounce morality. How can they, how can they make that, that well, accusation against the Bible? I'm going to get, get into, my point. I'm going to get into, well, they don't denounce morality. They say that morality is not objective, that there is a, there's a different source. And I'll get into that a little bit. Particularly, they claim that it's, it's built into the survival of the species, okay, that, that we, um, we'll talk about that. But they look at things like the, the God's instruction to the Israelites to kill all of the people of Canaan, men, women, and children, and even animals. All right? um, the, there are some, and the fact that there are times when they, they sacrifice tens of thousands of animals at one time in ceremonies in the Old Testament, etc. Um, now, and as Christians, we should have an understanding as to what we, what we believe about that. I'm not going to get into all of that, but that's what they look at. Okay? And they call God a bully, etc. We need to understand that so much of their beliefs, that most of them, Christopher Hitchens was not a scientist. Christopher Hitchens was a, was a journalist, a controversialist, a, a writer. Most of them are scientists, most of the people, and so they come from an evolutionary kind of scientific background. Um, and they would claim that their arguments are scientific arguments, but not everyone agrees. Again, Michael Roos, I quoted a minute ago, he is himself an atheist, although he is a real critic of Dawkins and the others. Michael Roos, in reading the book The God Delusion, which is one of the most popular of all the books the New Atheists have written, which is Dawkins' book, <coughs> says, finally and most importantly, Dawkins is engaged on a moral crusade. Not as a philosopher trying to establish premises and conclusions, in other words, he doesn't make any logical arguments, but as a preacher telling the ways to salvation and to damnation. Agree with him, or, and you're right. Disagree with him, and you're stupid and wrong. The God delusion is, above all, a work of morality. Now, this is another atheist saying this about Dawkins. That Dawkins is making moral evaluations. I'm going to give you some of the quotes from Dawkins in, in, in a minute that are just, you go, you know, um, where is he coming from on this stuff? Now, understand that there are some hard atheists, including among the new atheists, meaning people who take it seriously and are at least honest, and one of those is Peter Singer. Peter Singer is an, an ethnobiologist and an ecologist, um, and he, I mean, he's the one that says, if I had to choose between killing two cows or one person, I should kill the one person because cows are sentient being two, and there's no difference between them. Singer says, we can no longer base our ethics on the idea that human beings are a special form of creation made in the image of God, singled out from other animals, and alone possessing an immortal soul. Why should we believe that the mere fact that a being is a member of the species Homo sapiens endow its life with some unique, almost infinite value? He at least is being honest with where his belief takes him. The problem with the new atheists, most of them, although he's considered a new atheist, he's not one of the leaders, with the Richard Dawkinses and Sam Harris's and Christopher Hitchens when he was still alive and Daniel Dennett's, they will not admit that everything else they believe leads them to agree with Peter Singer. They want to have their have their their atheistic cake and eat it too, All right? And so they struggle to try to figure out how they can explain the moral um, the moral reality of human existence. One of Singer's former students, who's now a professor at Oxford, Julian Sabulescu, says, "I believe that God's existence is irrelevant. What matters is ethical behavior." Well, based on on um, Piatti's idea that we need to kill 90% of the people on the planet? Is that ethical behavior? He thinks it is. What 
if we don't believe there is anything beyond the physical, on what do we base our moral views? Uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov very famously said, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. And he's right. In fact, he not only is theologically right, he is epistemically right, meaning in terms of any understanding, and it, uh, epistemology is how we know things. And he is logically right. Albert Einstein said, our sense of beauty and our religious instincts are, and I, here I pick up the quote, although this is what he was talking about in the context, it was at a conference he was speaking, tributary forms in helping the reasoning faculty toward its highest achievements. <clears throat> you are right in speaking of the moral foundations of science, but you cannot turn around and speak of the scientific foundations of morality, which is exactly what Sam Harris and the others have done, to say science gives us a basis for morality. Einstein continued, every attempt to reduce ethics to scientific formulae must fail. He was a pretty good scientist, Albert Einstein, pretty smart guy. Richard Feynman, another scientist, uh, quite famous scientist, a popularizer of science, he and Stephen Jay Gould are two of the most important 20th century popularizers of scientists, science. Feynman said, even the greatest forces and abilities don't seem to carry any clear instructions on how to use them. In other words, how to use them right versus wrong. As an example, the great accumulation of understanding as to how the physical world behaves only convinces one that its behavior has a kind of meaninglessness about it. The sciences do not directly teach good or bad. Ethical values lie outside the scientific realm. All of these guys are saying, you cannot explain objective moral values, which virtually everybody agrees we have, from science. <laughs> Even Richard Dawkins himself at one point, now this was before he was influenced by Sam Harris, by the way. Dawkins says, it is pretty hard to defend absolute morals on anything other than religious grounds. Science has no methods for deciding what is ethical. Later on, he changed his tune. Guillermo, well, could you go and tell them we need for them to not make, to move somewhere further down to be doing that? Thank you. Um, sorry about that, but obviously we're building a building here. Um, another scientist, Holmes Rolston, said this, Science has made us increasingly competent in knowledge and power, but it has also left us decreasingly confident about right and wrong. The evolutionary past has not, made easy, made, has not been easy to connect with the ethical future. The evolutionary past has not been easy to connect with the ethical future. There is no obvious route from biology to ethics, despite the fact that here we are, the genesis of ethics is problematic. I mean, he's an atheistic scientist, but he's honest enough to say, can't really get there from here, and yet there it is, in terms of ethical beliefs. <laughs> Now, I'm going to give you kind of a, a logical argument on why they have a problem going from science to some, some attempt to try to ex explain where morality comes from. Um, this is, David Hume is a Scottish philosopher, an Enlightenment philosopher, and one of the most important philosophers ever. He used to, before I was a Christian, he was a great hero of mine. Um, and he still has huge impact on thinking today. He was an atheist. But David Hume identified the fact that there is what he called the is to ought problem. Is to ought basically says that you can make a, an indicative statement, which means a statement of fact, something either is or is not. Okay, that's an indicative statement. It's a factual. But the idea of saying something ought to be or ought not to be, which is a moral statement, is not an indicative statement. It's an imperative statement. It's completely two different categories of logical thought. And there is no inherent natural bridge between those two. To go from what is or is not to what ought or ought not be, in other words, to go from an indicative statement of fact to a statement of values, is a huge leap. If you, unless you assume that there is some objective moral 
foundation out there. Unless, you know, if you're coming from a purely scientific point of view, you've got to have some explanation for how you can go from is to ought. And Hume points that out. You cannot go from an indicative statement, which is scientific, to an imperative statement, which is moral, without some explanation. And yet they do it all the time. Sam Harris, who is the one who's kind of been prime, the, who wrote a whole book about uh, trying to explain mor where morality comes from, he said this, we simply must stand somewhere. I am arguing that in the moral sphere, it is safe to begin with the premise that it is good to avoid behaving in such a way as to produce the worst possible misery for everyone. Now, I want you to notice how many value words there are in there. The premise that it is good, good based on what? Good is a moral word. How do you define good? To avoid behaving in such ways to produce the worst. Worst in what way? And everybody, every thinking person that has written any commentary or any response to Harris has pointed out his assumptions in this. That he starts with a moral assumption that there are good things and bad things and then tries to claim that science gives us everything we need to know. But he's using an a priori, meaning before the fact, you know, to a starting out point of a moral conviction before he even makes any arguments. And he says, well, you have to, you have to stand somewhere. In other words, you have to start somewhere. And I'm just starting with the place that it's good not to do bad things. Well, duh, where are you getting that? One, uh, Kwame Anthony Apia wrote a critique of Harris's book, and he says, how do we know that the morally right act is, as Harris posits, the one that does the most to increase well-being, defined in terms of our conscious states of mind. How do we know what's good, in other words? Has science really revealed that? If it hasn't, then the premise of Harris's all-we-need-is-science argument must have some non-scientific origins. What he's saying is, Harris has gone from what is to what ought to be with no connection between the two. Exactly what David Hume in the 1600s said was irrational. You cannot argue that. And David Hume was an atheist. He was a nice atheist, but he was an atheist. Biologist P.Z. Myers, also an atheist, says, I don't think Harris's criterion that we can use science to justify maximizing the well-being of individuals is valid. We can't. Science cannot give us an ought or ought not. We can certainly use science to say how we can maximize well-being once we define well-being, although even that might be a bit more slippery than he portrays it. Harris is smuggling in an unscientific prior in his category of well-being. In other words, an unscientific prior means before he even tries to make his argument, there is underlying that something that's not based on science. He is making assumptions about what is good and what is bad, what is moral and what is immoral, and then claiming using that as a basis on which to argue that science is all you need. We can't do it. We cannot find any basis for moral ought, starting with nothing more than indicative statements of scientific is or is not. And Harris is wrong in doing that. Others have pointed out that you're starting with moral assumptions. Now, in response to that, to Meyer's statement, Sam Harris says this, to use Meyer's formulation, we must smuggle in an unscientific prior, quote unquote, those are the words that Meyer's used in his critique of Harris, to justify any branch of science. If this isn't a problem for physics, why should it be a problem for the science of morality? Can we prove without recourse to any prior assumptions that our definition of physics is the right one? No, because our standards of proof will be built on any definition, will be built into any definition we provide. He does not see that he has just said that no science can be based upon something that doesn't have a moral foundation. Remember our first class in here, we talked about the fact they claim that, you know, science is, doesn't have any faith. It doesn't have any, any presuming of truth. It's entirely based on evidence. We don't use faith. Faith is stupid. Sam Harris right here has just said we start with the assumption of faith in even defining what the sciences are, what they're looking for. And we would say that faith is involved in even evaluating the evidence that we find in scientific pursuits. And Harris has just confessed that, and yet he claims 
that science is without faith, that science, that morality is a purely a scientific kind of event. But if the unscientific prior, as Myers calls it, and as Sam Harris agrees to, he, can, he admits that, if the unscientific prior is a moral assumption, and it is because he says it is good to do this, that's a moral statement, then Harris cannot claim to deduce morality from science. He's starting with morality and bringing it to his scientific argument. He can't claim then that morality is being derived from science, which is his whole argument. He says that it is based upon survival of the species, that we are moral, we treat other people well, because by doing so, they'll treat us well, and if we all treat each other well, then the species will survive better. But there are huge categories of moral argument that does not fit that. For instance, altruism. Altruism is the willingness of people to sacrifice themselves for the sake of someone else's good. So altruism is the opposite of survival of the species. It's where I'm prepared to sacrifice myself, my own survival, if necessary, to protect somebody else. Altruism means that we will expend great effort and resources to protect the weak, the widow, the orphan, the blind, the disabled, the lame, whatever. And that is part of our objective moral reality. Altruism is part of that. Altruism cannot be explained in any way by survival of the species. All right? And so it doesn't hold. Let me finish this statement and then I'll, I'll uh, John. And by the same token, Harris then cannot rule out the prior assumption of God. If he's making a prior assumption that some things are good and some things are not good, and then he's bringing that to the argument as, a, as a, an unscientific prior, then he is, in, in effect, admitting there are some things that exist before we come to science. Why not God? John? He uses the unscientific prior uh, in relationship to physics as an excuse to continue his argument. Do you know what that unscientific prior in physics is that he's so confident in? I'm sure that he, uh, I don't know exactly, but I'm sure that he is arguing from the point of view that there are, we make an assumption of um, laws. I mean, starting with Isaac Newton and then with Einstein, Einstein revised all of that but that there is a predictability to the physical world. That gra the force of gravity is a constant. That the strong and weak electric, uh, you know, uh, uh, attraction, forces of attraction in the molecular world are givens, they're constants. That, that the electromagnetic force is a constant. We come to those things with the assumption that we can rely, that, that those are givens that we can rely on, that we don't have to explain them to know that they're there. I think that's where he's coming from. That in every science, there are assumptions of absolutes and of truths and of realities. And yet, that very fact is inconsistent with the fact that they say, no, we start with a completely blank slate and we only go where the evidence takes us. Really? It doesn't work. All right? In terms of whether science can give us morality, um, we are not saying that science cannot um, cannot help us make ethical decisions science can at least make us know what what the what the facts are right um, science can tell me that if I put strychnine in my grandmother's tea she will die science cannot tell me whether it's right or wrong to do that in order to get her property okay you see the difference Science may be a premise. Science can tell us that animals really do experience pain and misery, but it cannot tell me whether or not I should, should submit animals to chemical testing in order to be able to make products that I'll make a lot of money on. That's a moral question. So science may be a precursor, but at some point we have to have some other source of being able to say something is good or not good. Science says what is or is not. It cannot say what ought or ought not to be. Yes, Lynn. When I was in high school, I had a terrific physics teacher who um, was not only a great scientist, but a great Christian. And he started out his very first physics class by explaining the very best of scientists are the very best of Christians. Mm -hmm. He said, because you cannot follow through with the principles of science unless you start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I found that a very profound statement in 
the 60s when the church was in a big turmoil and all those things. And the church was fine. We were in a turmoil. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, Vatican II and all those things were, were happening. Yeah. Um, and I can remember going home to my father, who was not really a Christian, uh, but was a great thinker about how things worked and went together. And I said, what do you think of that? And he said, the man could be saying the first bit of truth that has ever been uttered. You know, that you cannot have science without first in God. Right. Well, uh, I think that's very true. And in fact, some of the very best of the scientists really are Christians. Again, we've mm -hmm. talked before, Francis Collins, the director of the Human Genome Project, um, considered, almost universally considered, the most significant human science effort ever in history, is a Christian. You know, people like John Polkinghorne, who, you know, was one of the most recognized, you know, he was knighted, he's Sir John Polkinghorne, he was knighted because of his advances in quantum physics. Retired from being a, uh, a professor of quantum physics at Cambridge, I think it was Cambridge, may have been Oxford, um, in order to go back to seminary and become a, a, a rector in an Anglican church, um, and on and on. Okay. So it's not like you have to be stupid in order to believe this stuff. <laughs> um, and, and yet, the, the purpose of this class is us knowing how to respond to some of those things, and their claim that science can give us everything we need. Science can give us an explanation for morality. No, Sam Harris, the one who's most worked at it, and I'm going to give you some Dawkins here in a bit. Um, they start with presumptions. I mean, they do in everything. They start with presumptions about what is good and what is not good, and then don't even admit it, don't recognize it. As I say, I, I absolutely don't agree with, you know, um, with Nietzsche or Sartre or Camus or, uh, you know, the guy who wants to spread Ebola virus or Peter Singer, but at least they're honest. They'll admit where, where it goes, that there isn't any morality. I mean, they, they answer the question by saying the premise that their objective moral truth simply isn't valid anymore. Well, most of the guys that are popular, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, for instance, which is Dawkins, Harris, um, Christopher Hitchens, and Daniel Dennett, they all still try to defend the, the existence of morality, rather than just throw it out and say, well, you know, let's kill 90% of the people because the planet will be better off, like Singer does. Or not Singer, uh, Piety. Let's take our break now. Okay. Um, Part of what we're talking about here is the fact that if we accept, as most, almost everybody does, unless they're mentally ill or really hardcore atheists, um, that there is some objective moral truth, that certain things are right and wrong no matter where you're coming from, then the question is, what is the source of that? From where does it come? As I said, that um, Sam Harris and others have claimed that it comes as a natural result of our survival of the species kind of thing, but there are real problems with that. The idea of making the argument that, as, we, as we've just seen, that science provides us with that moral basis, we, they start out with assumptions that there are good, there are good things and there are evil things. Well, where does that very thing come from? There should be a, kind of a non you can't say something is good or evil unless you start out with some sort of moral presumption. And they're unable to do that. Um, in fact, I, I mentioned to you that, that David Hume says you can't go from is to ought. He, in, in fact, he expands on that. He says that is, the indicative statement, something is or it is not, which is a science statement. He said that can only be based upon either empirical evidence or upon logical necessity. In other words, you have to have some proof that something is or isn't, or else there must be, like in mathematics, a logical necessity. There's no other way to get there. And he's that, So his argument is, when you talk about something ought to be or ought not to be, there is neither a logical necessity, nor is there any empirical evidence, meaning something you can measure. Back to that thing about you can't do a, a, a CAT scan and see where moral Object, the moral objective, uh, the objective moral truth is inside the human brain or the human heart or anywhere else. So when Hume and others make the argument that you can't go from is to ought, 
He actually has criteria for that, that something is or is not based upon either empirical evidence or it's based upon logical necessity like mathematics. You have none of those criteria for what ought or ought not be. So where do, what criteria do you have? Based on what does everybody agree that the Nazis did something evil? Sam Harris's argument makes an assumption that certain things are good or evil to begin with. So he assumes a moral objectivity before he even gets to it. Now, I told you, I gave you a quote from, from Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, who is the leader of the New <laughs> saying that it is very difficult to understand where ethical principles come from. He admitted that. Then later on, being influenced by Sam Harris and some others, he began to change his tune. And I want to show you how he's changed his tune. He is, uh, Dawkins is most known for his biological theories. He is a, a scientific biologist, uh, an evolutionary biologist. He, his first really important book didn't have anything to do with atheism. It was called The Selfish Gene. He articulated for the first time the means by which evolution happens by saying that the genes, that is the, the part of the human uh, genome, the genes, that they in effect sort of have a will of their own, that they are driven by this will to reproduce and so he has a whole scientific argument for the fact that the genes are the mechanism, the selfishness of the genes, the insistence that they reproduce unconsciously, but still with, with, with motivation, they're driven to reproduce. His selfish gene theory is the thing that first made him famous uh, and got him all of the accolades that he's had as a, you know, as a scientist, a professor, etc. And then later on, he sort of adapted that into the idea of atheistic evolution. I mean, he'd been an atheist all along. In fact, he says that as a young man, he had been involved in church, but when he discovered Darwinian evolution, it convinced him he didn't need God in order to explain everything. Now, I want to give you some quotes from him. The question is, do, does even Richard Dawkins, who kind of invented this idea, does he really believe in blind, selfish, gene-driven evolution? <coughs> Because when he starts trying to deal with moral ethics, he begins to change his tune. And I want to give you four quotes from him, and you can see it happening. First, he wrote, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect um, if there is, shouldn't it be if there is, not of there is. If there is at the bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. So he's saying there's no moral objectivity. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA, meaning our genes, neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. All right? Here he's talking like a hard atheist. There is no good or evil. There is no right or wrong, there is no design, there is no purpose, which is what you would expect if you have a naturalistic, Darwinian approach to understanding the world, right? Good with that? He also said, we are survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. That's his selfish gene theory. But then... He begins to change. He begins to suggest that of all the genetic beings in the universe, that human beings alone have an option. Now, there's no option in this for earlier statements. But he says this later. We are built as gene machines, but we have the power to turn against our creators. We alone on the earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. On the one hand, he, still, he says and still maintains that genes, our DNA, will replicate. They will pass on their characteristics to future generations. There's no way around it. It's going to happen. But then, in the face of the question, the serious question that is raised by the existence of any sort of moral objective, uh, good or evil, he begins to say, well, yeah, that's true, but people still have a choice. He even goes so far as to say, for an understanding, this is late in Dawkins, um, 
For an understanding of modern man, we must begin by throwing out the gene as the sole basis of our idea on ideas on evolution. That's exactly contrary to his whole premise. All of these are quotes from the same guy over a period of time. The last two quotes are reflecting the fact that neither Dawkins nor Sam Harris nor anybody else has ever really been able to come up with any explanation why how, how everybody, basically, who's not, you know, a little bit cray-cray, that everybody believes that there are some things that are good and some things that are evil. So he begins to morph into this idea that, well, yeah, we are just genetic machines, but we have a choice. And then he goes so far as to say, in fact, if you really want to understand people, you have to sort of get rid of this idea of the selfish gene. That's your whole, that's your whole shtick, Dick. What are, you, what are you saying? You know, where are you coming from here? The fact is, if we believe, as Dawkins has always maintained, that we are genetic replicators, that's all we are, that's the only, you know, that all biological entities are genetic replicators. Our genes drive us, they are the selfish gene. Then, what could be our motivation? I mean, even though he says we have, you know, we have to throw, you know, we have motivations other than that. What could be our motivation, much less what could be the mechanism for us to rebel against that purely biological drive that our genetic materials have? He says, oh yeah, but we can turn against our creator genes. That we, in fact, have to set that idea aside. Well, what is it in us that gives us the, either the motivation or the ability to do that? Because if you believe that there is a motivation or an ability to be something other than purely biological, in other words, if you have some sort of moral motivation, where does that come from, John? Does he define that? No. No, he doesn't. No. No. I mean, he and Harris will say, it's, it, well, it's part of the survival of the species, that we do this, we can make those choices because, you know, that keeps everybody, more people alive, and so our species continues. They are unable to decide or, or explain how it is that so much of the moral decision making is actually contrary to what would be considered survival drive. Yes? If his opinions are science, and science is based on empirical, is empirical, empirical. then how does he manage to change his mind in midstream? I mean, the facts, would, me. if he's based on facts, the facts have to change. Well, the facts, you, you can say that two and two is always going to be four. You can say the facts haven't changed, but what happens is more and more and more people have been hammering Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, these guys, with the fact that, wait a minute, there's something wrong with your argument. Which defines that his, his argument is not based on science. And so they come up with these waffled statements, like this. <laughs> Right? Because they can't deny there's something else out there. If there is really, as he has always argued, um, only a non-material, um, or, or only a material genetic force in the universe, then what is it in us that might cause us to rebel against that genetic material, as he now is admitting we do? What could possibly cause us to behave not biologically, but morally, if there is no objective moral truth? which they would argue, there's no objective moral truth, there's simply a biological imperative. And yet, they have to then swing around and say, well, maybe biological imperative is not the only thing. But they don't give any other explanation. They cannot, and this is a major point, they cannot concede that there is anything beyond the naturalistic world. Because to do so destroys everything that they base everything on. I mean, there's nothing left of their argument. The, and I quoted this from G.K. Chesterton earlier. Chesterton points out that an atheist has to have an absolutely pure argument. There can be no exception to a naturalistic atheistic argument. Any single exception, anything that's not natural, anything that's metaphysical, any one thing that is supernatural, and everything, the whole house of cards falls apart. Whereas a Christian, I'm perfectly happy. We should be perfectly happy saying there's stuff we don't understand. You know, to say, Dawkins has got some good points, all right? To say, yeah, it's really hard to explain why God told the Israelites to kill everybody in Canaan, man, woman, and child. That's a tough one. I'm okay with that. But a Dawkins or a Sam Harris cannot concede even one exception to their system, or it all falls apart. And so, 
he can't acknowledge an exception. All he can do is waffle in the hopes that people will stop you know, poking him about it. All right? So, let's come back to Dostoevsky's logical argument. If God does not exist, then everything is permitted. That's what Dostoevsky said in the Brother Skaramatsov. If naturalistic science is true, then God does not exist. I'm, this isn't the same argument I made earlier. I'm, I'm, I'm starting with a, uh, a slightly different premise. The conclusion, if naturalistic science is true, then everything is permitted. There is no morality. There is no ought or ought not. If naturalistic science is true, you can never go any further than is or is not. Indicative statements. You can never make an imperative statement, ought or ought not. There is no bridge from here to there. Because naturalistic science is based entirely upon what Hume talked about. It's based entirely upon either empirical evidence or logical necessity. A naturalistic argument, or a naturalistic viewpoint, a worldview, believes that everything is either empirically ver verifiable or it is logically necessary, like mathematics. And as Hume pointed out, and everybody has, you know, people have waffled about it, but nobody's been able to refute that. That's the thing about David Hume, is he says these really, really important things that people can't refute. That's why he's still important. Well, a naturalistic viewpoint only bases things on empirical verifiability or upon logical necessity. You cannot make a moral evaluation based on either of those things. And so, if naturalistic science is true, then everything is permitted. There is no moral values. There's no other way to see it. No matter how much Dawkins might try to waffle, no matter how much Sam Harris might try to say that he's not using any moral evaluations as the basis for his arguments. He is. And other atheists point out that he is. It's not just religious people who are disagreeing on, on this. They're saying, you guys are making really dumb arguments. And yet, they're the ones with the best sellers. See? Dawkins and Harris and Hitchens and Daniel Dennett all have had best-selling books. Some of them, many, best, several best-selling books. Despite this logical argument, which I don't think can be refuted, the new atheists, unlike hard atheists like Nietzsche and Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, the new atheists do not deny the real existence of objective morality. They try very hard to explain it. They struggle to try to explain it within their naturalistic paradigm. They do not claim, like Nietzsche would have, that you know Nietzsche's whole theme was a will to power. If you are strong enough to conquer, you go. The ubermensch, the superman, is the one who is willing to admit the hard thing of saying, if I have the power to conquer, I should conquer. And that's the right thing, which is the natural the natural development that comes out of Darwinian survival of the fittings. Okay? Yes? Was that previous to the Nazis? Or were the yes. Nazis well, actually, the Nazis, much of the theory was kind of based on, on Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. Was that was uh, Nietzsche prior to the Nazis? Yes. Um, so, you know, where do you go from there? They keep making the argument, and almost nobody other than them believes it's true, or people who don't think about it. See, they have best-selling books because people be pick up these books, and somehow our culture has decided that's cool. That God is not great, Hitchens' book, or The God Delusion, Dawkins' best-selling book, or The Moral Landscape, Sam Harris's book, or Letter to a Christian Nation, which Sam Harris also wrote, or whatever, that those are cool. Without bothering to question philosophically whether or not that stuff holds water. The fact is, if DNA is all we really are, which is the argument of naturalistic science, and DNA neither knows nor cares about values, there is no morality, and yet, as Dawkins says, we dance to DNA's music, then how is it that people do both know and care about what is good and evil? We do. Everybody does. <clears throat> Unless, like I say, you're a little cray cray, a little crazy, or a comp you know, we have a word for that. We call it being a sociopath. <laughs> and even though you get people like Peter Singer and others who will write this stuff, they don't actually go out and eat babies, which would seem to be a very logical kind of, you know, it's a good protein source, and there's too many of them in the world anyway. 
They don't actually do that, even though they would argue that that makes sense from their philosophical perspective. So where, after all, is the delusion? You know, all of these statements about the God, they talk a lot about the God delusion, the title of, um, of Dawkins' best-selling book. They talk a lot about how we, who are religious people, especially Christians, more because we're the biggest and we're in, in Western nations more, that we are deluded. We are, in effect, mentally ill because we believe in God. Well, when you look at all of this, who's really deluded, guys? What we maintain makes sense with what everybody, you know, other than the ones I could count on one hand, believe. Who's really deluded here? Your arguments to try to figure out how both you can accept the fact there's a morality and the fact that there is no, nothing beyond the naturalistic world, the arguments do not hold. The center will not hold, as they say. So who's really deluded? So where does our morality come from? If it's not explainable by survival of the species, if it's not, you know, and they would insist that um, it, it's purely scientific explanation for it, and their arguments are good, Dawkins says, no one takes their morality from the Bible. Really? I thought I did. It's interesting, in the, in the debate that I watched between Christopher Hitchens and, and Alistair McGrath, uh, Hitchens claimed, I mentioned this before, Hitchens claimed that he has been challenging people for years, of course he's been dead since 2011, but that prior to that, for years he had been challenging people to give him even one statement where morality, real moral action, was based upon religious conviction. And he said, no one has ever been able to do it. No one has been able to give me a single religious statement that is the basis of moral action. Nobody knows the Ten Commandments? Well, I mean, he would say, you could argue that. Well, I, gave, I, I thought of one when I'm watching this. Um, when Mother Teresa and the Sisters of Charity, before she became as famous when she was working in Calcutta, um, a reporter came and said, uh, how can you do this? A reporter from, from the West came and, and saw the work, and, and he said, these people are suffering from leprosy and disease and contagious stuff and everything else, and you and the sisters are going out and literally picking them up in your arms and bringing them back here to your center and washing them by hand and giving them bedclothes and putting them in a, in a clean bed, sometimes just for a short time until they die. And the guy said, it's really gross. How can you do that? And Mother Teresa said, oh, it's not hard, because we can always look at these people and say, it's all right, Jesus, I'm here now. As much as you've done unto one of the least of these, you have done it for me. Well, Christopher Hitchens probably wouldn't accept that, because Christopher Hitchens wrote a book saying he thought that Mother Teresa was stupid. Oh, well. <laughs> he liked to pick, you know, famous people that people liked, and then write how awful they were. That is a, a statement of moral conviction based upon a religious belief. So Dawkins was wrong. Uh, Hitchens was wrong, and Dawkins is wrong. Interestingly, there is a German philosopher, a sociologist and philosopher, who is an atheist named Jürgen Habermas. He is a very important academic philosopher in Germany. He's dealt a lot with um, sociological phenomena having to do with the changes in Europe and, you know, uh, the motivation for human conduct and all kinds of stuff. And some big words in here. This is worth hearing. Habermas wrote this. Universalistic egalitarianism. Let's all say that together. Universalistic egalitarianism. <laughs> meaning everybody being equal. That's all that means. From which sprang the ideas, ideals of freedom and a collective life in solidarity, meaning being, being united in the idea that we're going to live as a community. The autonomous conduct of life and emancipation, freedom. The individual morality of conscience, 
human rights and democracy is a direct legacy of the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. He is an atheist, but he is a renowned sociologist and philosopher. All of those things, morality, human rights, democracy, the idea of autonomy, of freedom, are all based upon the Jewish ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. He continues, this legacy, substantially unchanged, has been the object of continual critical appropri appropriation and interpretation. People have accepted it and reinterpreted it, but it's still the same. To this day, there is no alternative to it. And in light of the current challenges of a post-national constellation, Germany breaking up and trying to sort all that out, we continue to draw on the substance of this heritage. Everything else is just idle, postmodern talk. I like that last part. <laughs> he is not a religious person. He's an atheist. But he is a renowned philosopher and sociologist. And he, and he's not the only one, he and many other authorities in this field will say that all of our Western culture, all of the values we have, all of our morality, the ideas of freedom and autonomy and personal conscience and human rights and democracy and all of those things which we believe are expressions or outpourings of moral good in society are based upon the Judeo-Christian ethic, the Jewish ethic of justice, the Christian ethic of love, which was simply added on when Jesus came. Take that, Richard Dawkins. <laughs> and where, where does the, the Jewish ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love come from? The Bible. Well, it comes from God, but it is reflected in the Bible. That's where we have that message. And yet Dawkins says nobody gets their morality from the Bible. It's simply not true. He's simply wrong. And yet people hear that or read that and they go, Wow! Dawkins is so smart. He's not as smart as he thinks he is. And I pray for him because someday I fear that unless he changes his mind about some things, he is going to be confronted with how just wrong he was. We find the source of this objective morality in the truth God has given us that has been specifically expressed in the Hebrew Bible, which we call the Old Testament, and in the Christian Bible of the New Testament, it tells us that God is the source of what is good, and He defines what is evil. He's not the source of evil, but we understand what is evil based upon what, is good, what God has told us. That is given to us in the Bible. Dawkins is wrong. Hitchens was wrong. There are religious statements that lead us to moral conduct. The whole Bible. I mean, you could say the Ten Commandments, Rudy. You're right. You could say the whole Bible. That's what Jürgen uh, Habermas has said. They have not been able to respond to the question of where does any sense of objective, moral, good, or bad come from. Their arguments do not hold water. Even other atheists admit that. Questions or comments about that? Yes. There is, there is a, whatever they call, free thinkers group here in that. Which is a, a fancy word for atheists. Exactly. It friend, is. Free thinkers are atheists. Yeah. I have a friend who goes and says that is her question. She is Jewish by heritage, etc., and is a very caring, loving person. And I said to her, you know deep inside and in here, as well as in her heart, where those answers are, but you just cannot accept them because you're slightly stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, possibly, but I know if I go there, I have a better chance of getting answers than if I go to synagogue. And I found that to be a very distressing statement. Yeah. Um... You know, she's uh, <coughs> I introduced her to a, a friend who was a Roman Catholic priest and just happened we were at a <coughs> restaurant and I went over to say hello to her. And before she even said hello, she said, I don't believe in God. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, So? <laughs> and he introduced himself. Yeah. You know, it seems like many of these statements and many of these people we've been looking at, there is a great 
um, desire to make a profound statement and, and just they, they got to hold on to it for dear life because they uh, are afraid or, or uh, unwilling to open up to anything else. Yeah, even it's, they did buy it. We have a, a, a couple who are good friends, uh, not close to those friends, but still good friends that are Jewish, and we've invited them over to you a couple times. I, they haven't been able to come yet because of illness and whatnot, but uh, it's like every time we say, well, can I have you over for dinner? You know, the, the wife is very funny. We'll say, well, we're not going to convert. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, that's fine. We're not asking you over to convert you. We want to have food together, <laughs> you know. Um, I have, I have a, a lot of friends who are not people of faith, and that's fine. And I, I think, in fact, that's required for us because... Um, we're told to be salt and light to the world. Mm -hmm. And as I've said many, many times, especially if you come to service, I've said it in, in church many times, we cannot be salt and light to the world if we don't get close enough for them to see us and taste us. Um, and so we need to do that. And yeah, I, we have to be, have a generosity of spirit that means our, we don't just see people as targets <laughs> for spiritual or any other kind of goal, objective. Um, and yet, that, that's not to say we can't believe that there is truth and that we can find it. See, so many people, everyone has questions. But as is often the case, we only find the things we're looking for. We only see the things that we're open to seeing. And our belief as Christians is that, that um, nobody can be argued into the faith. See, that's the point. Nobody, nobody can come to a true knowledge of God without God himself interceding in their hearts, you know, the idea of the Holy Spirit touching people and saying, you know, at the point at which the Holy Spirit says, this is true, this is right, this is good, that Jesus is who he claimed to be and who, who his followers claimed he was, that only God, only the Holy Spirit can touch people. So we can't argue people in belief, you know, and so relax a little bit. It's not our job. It's not up to us to do that. Um, and yet, people do seek, people do look. And it, it, I mentioned to you before that at one of the major atheistic events, there was a woman who did a presentation, and she said that, that she thought that atheists should develop creeds and liturgies and you know, <coughs> confessions that they can share together. In other words, she was acknowledging that there is something inherent in human beings that we desire that. We desire the ability to be able to celebrate together what we find is truth. Um, and yet... I think they would find that if they ever pursued it, which I don't think they have, they would find that singularly unsatisfying because there's a hollowness to it. <laughs> um, and yet, everybody's looking for that. And amongst, amongst those who have decided that they are not going to be people of faith, um, atheist groups, atheist has a negative uh, tone to a lot of people, and so they come up with different names, free thinkers, or brights. That's one that Daniel Dennett has really supported, you know, the, the bright movement as opposed to all of us dulls <laughs> who are people of faith um, because they feel like there's a negative connotation to the idea of atheists. Now they're fighting against that, but um, yeah, and I, I people, people are where they are, they are who they are, and as God chooses to touch them, if he wishes to use us to do it, then that's fine. But it's, you know, we're, we are not in the business of judging people. That's not our job. We're in the business of inviting people to what we have found to be the great satisfaction, the great encouragement. Uh, but it's an act of joy, it's not an act of condemnation. So, anyway, I'm preaching a sermon here. Any other questions or comments? I can I can follow a sermon like that. <laughs> well, I burned through my material, my material very quickly, so if there are no other questions or comments, uh, we're gonna this sort of carries over to what we're gonna talk about next week, and that is the influence of religion. You know, we've made this sort of logical argument and using Habermas and others' arguments that it is the Judeo-Christian ethic, it is religious belief that has led us into ethical, uh, ethical understanding, even though um, Hitchens, probably more than any of the others, would insist that religion is the source of all evil, that it is religion that has caused all of the brokenness and maliciousness and crime and, and war and, and you know, murder in the world. We'll talk about that next week, because I don't think he's right. Thank you all. We will see you next week.